identity. Who are you? Who are you? So if you don't mind, I'm going to take just a few minutes, and I want to tell you about me. And this is not all about me, but I, I want to kind of relate for a second because I think some of you might be able to kind of, kind of have a little bit of relation to this. I was born in 1982, way back when, you know, there was no electricity. And um, no, yeah, people who were born before then were like, whatever, <laughs> whatever. 1982 in a small town called Pilihatchie, Mississippi. From what I understand, there was one red light, and there's still one red light in Pillahatchie, Mississippi, the last I, I checked. Most new arrivals, when they come into the world, they demand all the attention. Yes, yes. And all the dads are going, and that came in. Yes, yes. And I did, just like every other newborn baby. I came into the world, and I was just like, ah, pay attention to me. Here I am, let the fun begin. However, I have a picture of my um, my father holding me I was not the center of attention <laughs> because of my chubby cheeks <laughs> I was big boned y'all just feel me there for a second I was big boned <laughs> aren't I adorable but it wasn't my precious chubbiness that brought attention see I wasn't actually born that color I had no oxygen <laughs> yeah so I was a little bit more blue I guess maybe Smurf-like at that time. But because of my lack of color and my lethargic body, everyone rushed to me to see if they could fix it. See, because of my traumatic entrance, I was born with what was called shoulder dystocia, which caused brachial palsy. Basically, that means that all of the nerves, like from my chin down through my shoulder, were ripped, pulled during the birth. So I was born paralyzed with my arm. It wasn't like pulled behind my back, but it, it wouldn't move. You can see it's kind of limp there while he's holding me. I was a beautiful baby, but I was damaged. I was damaged. I was noticeably damaged. It was my understanding that the doctors actually informed my parents that, uh, oh, well, tough luck. Sorry about that can't really do anything. They went to specialists. They went to all kinds of different pediatrician specialists, and they said, well, you know, she's just damaged. Sometimes this happens. She'll be all right. You know, at least she's alive. <laughs> she's just paralyzed. So I was named Amy, and I was paralyzed on my left side, and that was who I was. It wasn't my fault that I was paralyzed. I want somebody to kind of to grab that just for a second. I was damaged noticeably due to something that I had no control over. Something had happened to me that identified who I was. Everybody with me on that? Okay, we'll, we'll come back. I was damaged. However, I would be expected to live with it. I would be expected to work around it and deal with it. However... Thank God for howevers. When I was three months old, something incredible happened. Wonderful, fascinating, awesome. You see, God had blessed me with stubborn family. <laughs> now, some of you may understand this. I had a stubborn grandma of faith. Because when the doctors say, well, she'll have to deal with it, grandma said, oh, oh, oh no, no. I don't, mm -mm, I don't receive that. That's what you think, but in Jesus' name, something else is going to happen. And so my grandmother wouldn't give up. And while my parents were out um, working, I think they were in the yard or something. I don't remember the story. I was three months old. I don't know. But I'm told that my grandmother had me laying in my little bassinet, and she would pick my arm up, and she would drop it, and, you know, and just kind of let it go. And she'd say, in Jesus' name, and she'd pick it up, let it go. Pick it up, she'd let it go. Jesus' name. And she did it over and over again. My little arm would just kind of fall down to the bed until it didn't. You see, one of those times when she called on the name of Jesus, he stepped in. And he was like, hello, here I am. What's your name? Because the Bible says he's as close as the mention of his name. So he stepped in, and he, he just touched my arm. Oh, my goodness, he healed me. I started moving my arm. Praise break. 
people started worshiping God in the house, and it was a beautiful thing. People were just worshiping. They took me back to the doctor, and the doctor was like, I don't know. I don't know how this happened. She's supposed to be paralyzed. Supposed to be. Doctors couldn't explain it. They still can't. Still can't explain it. I heard this story throughout my entire childhood. Anybody in here have a story that that you've heard your entire life of how God provided, how he healed, how he blessed? We've got some healings in here, some miracles, some provisions. Maybe your children have heard the story and they can repeat the testimony and it's something that is just, it's yours. That's my testimony. That is mine. I was damaged, but God healed me. And that became my testimony. That became part of my identity. And I loved it and I owned it. Look at me. I'm normal just like everybody else. I'm normal. My name is Amy and God healed me when I was a baby. And that miracle was my identity. Until one day. (laughs) I was probably about nine years old. And I was clapping my hands to one of the songs that they were playing at junior camp. Now, junior camp songs are not particularly deep (laughs) and anointed, maybe, I don't know. So we were doing one of those, I'm going to clap, 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 I'm going to, you know, whatever. And I'm just, I'm having a good old time, and I'm clapping, I'm having just, woo, yeah, I'm getting with it. And I'm just worshiping, and there's this little boy beside me, I turn around, he's going. (laughs) So I just, works over here and he finally stopped me he said why do you clap like that clap like what why you clap like that what are you talking about why do I clap like what he said you look different that's what I said (laughs) I looked at him thoroughly confused clapped like what I'm just like you. I'm normal. God healed me. That was my miracle. That's who I am. I'm not different. What are you talking about? He said, you clap weird. Okay. I clap weird. You're weird, but that's okay. (laughs) But let me tell you something that I did not understand the sincerity of at that moment. It was at that very moment, at the age of nine, that I experienced the first step of identity theft. Because the definition of identity is who you are, it's the way you think of yourself, the way you are viewed by the world, the characteristics that define you. That is identity. Now let me ask you again. Who are you? What identifies you? What is your identity? (laughs) Then it takes on a little bit of a deeper meaning, doesn't it? What characteristics define you? Who are you? In my early days as a free, carefree child, I did not realize I was different. I really didn't. And I think that my parents are so admirable because they didn't point out that I was different. I didn't notice because if I couldn't catch the ball like everybody else, I just adjusted things. Either I didn't play ball or I would catch it differently than everyone else. I didn't notice that there was a problem. I just thought, make it work. Whatever. Whatever. I had learned to manage, and I felt completely normal. However, with the help of that little boy, I started noticing that I was, in fact, different. And I started to... uh, Notice I was not like everyone else. I started comparing myself to everyone else. This is the first step in identity theft. When you start looking around and saying, well, they can, oh, but I can't do that. And they can do, hmm, I can't do that either. I would look at the way other people would raise their hands in the air, and I'd look at mine just kind of pull my arm down because I I didn't want anybody to see that I wasn't holding my arm like everybody else was. 
I would see how um, everyone else could hold their arm. They can do this with their left arm. They can put their hands straight up in the air like that. Never in my life have I ever been able to do that with my left hand. My elbow goes out. So I can, you know, usher traffic all day, but that's the limit of it. <laughs> that's the limit. Um, I go to the doctor's office, and they take my blood pressure on my left hand, and I'm, I'm kind of limboing, trying to get my hand back there, and they're, you know, playing tug of war. I'm like, God, it's just not going to happen. This is, this is what it is. I notice that other people could clap with their elbow down at their side. You don't know how talented you are to be able to do that. I look around sometimes when people clap, and they've got their arms down like this, and they're clapping. I'm like, man, that's really cool. I wish I could do that. That's, my elbow hasn't touched my side in, ever. <laughs> never. Never has. Never. I watch people who have something in their right hand, and so they'll take a tissue and wipe their nose with their left hand. I can't touch my face with my left hand. That's why I was so excited when the low buns came in, because then I could do those, because I can't get my hand up there. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. That hairstyle is for me. Hallelujah. I claim it. <laughs> Suddenly, I was no longer normal, and my identity was being stolen by realization. My childhood obliviousness had gone. Mm. Mm. I no longer was just the girl that God had healed. I was just the girl God had touched. Now watch me for a second. I want you to see how I viewed things differently. At once I was the girl God had healed. Now I'm the girl that God touched but did not completely heal. Do you see how the mentality changes and your identity starts kind of drifting away? Now, I'm a stubborn person, <laughs> and I'm tough to a certain extent, in public anyway. So throughout my childhood, I would have people ask me, what is wrong with your arm? What's, what's different about you? And while I loved the opportunity to testify about what God had done in my life, I was constantly reminded that I am different. We have a, a very natural thing that where we desire to be able to fit in. And when something happens in your life, whether it's visible or not, when it's pointed out that you are different, we isolate ourselves. We pull ourselves away. Because it hurts to be different. Yes? I will never forget. Now, I know this sounds, I promise, we're going we're gonna to dance in a minute, I promise. Y'all hang with me. <laughs> Um, people would ask me, what's wrong with your arm? What is different? What is, why are you doing that? And sometimes it was out of sheer concern. Somebody would come up and say, have you hurt your arm? But sometimes it was malicious. Have you ever seen someone who has a weakness in other people? It's like they zone in on the prey. Oh, my goodness. I was, I was protected from people like that for a long time. But then as I hit my teenage years, I realized why hamsters eat their young. There are some people that once they hit teenage years, Pastor, can I say that? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Ooh, it's been so nice being here. <laughs> I just want to let y'all know that. In the teenage years, there's this infinite wisdom that comes, like on the 13th birthday, and all of a sudden, everything is just known, you know? Well, and, and that's when you need to move out and buy a car and build a house and all that, while you still know everything. So when I was about 17, coincidentally, about the time my parents came here and, and preached the last time, I had a friend who came home from Bible college, and she just casually asked me, she said, do you know so-and-so? I said, I don't believe I do. She said, oh, sure, you know so-and-so. This is what she looks like. I said, you know, it seems like I kind of remember that person vaguely, you know, maybe from camp. And she said, really, you don't know her? I said, no, I, I don't know that I've ever actually met her. I don't think that we've ever had a conversation. I just remember seeing her and knowing her by association. She said, wow. So she's not like an arch enemy of yours. I said, well, no. No, I, I mean, what? No, I don't have any problem with it. You know, I think, in fact, I thought she was beautiful. She said, wow, okay. I said, why do you ask? She said, well, she goes to school with me at, at this college. And she said, she, she told me that she knew you. I said, 
oh, okay. She said, yeah, she told me she absolutely hated you. I was like, well, well that's harsh. <laughs> Why? Listen, she could not stand you because of the way you would walk into the room with your shoulders back like you own the world. Let me tell you a secret. I can't slouch. I can't. It's physically impossible for me to, like, I can pull my left shoulder down, but other than that, I can't. My shoulders won't slouch. So my posture is by default because <laughs> it's, it's my only option. <laughs> but my heart was crushed, and I laughed. I was like, well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Oh, my goodness, because we laugh when we hurt. And I was, I was absolutely devastated. Oh, my goodness, how in the world can you be despised because of an injury? How could you be judged based on something that you had no control over? How could something that is hidden be so visible in your identity? My heart broke, and this was my question. How in the world can I ever do anything for God if people decide that they hate me before they ever meet me? If just the way I look causes them to run? That's a deep question for a 17-year-old. Can I tell you it is not an uncommon question for a 17-year-old? How can I do anything for God? I'm just, or I've been through, or I was born into, or my family is. We adopt identity traits. We let people put labels on us, and we act like we don't have the ability to remove them. I had become a victim of my identity that I had not placed on myself. So now my identity had been stolen and transformed into the snob who thinks she's better than everyone else. I chose humor as a scab to cover that. If I made fun of myself before anybody else did, then we can laugh together. I'm sure nobody here has ever done that. <laughs> There's a lot of things we choose to cover hurt. There's a lot of things. I want you to notice something. This identity theft did not happen overnight. If somebody came in and said, oh, what's your name? Oh, not anymore. That's my name now, and you're just going to have to go be something different. We would stop that, right? If the devil came in and told you, oh, you think you're a child of God, you're nothing. We'd be like, you want to fight? Come on. I know I'm a child of God. You can't tell me anything different. You can't tell me that I'm worthless. But... If he uses somebody close to you, and it starts with one negative word, one discouragement, maybe it's something in your mind, maybe it's a stronghold in your mind that you don't seem to want to let go, and every time God starts moving, you start thinking, no, this isn't really for me, I'm not worth it. God can use anybody else. I have no problem with it being the mighty God in Jesus, but the mighty God in me I have a problem with, because, you know, God's got better people to use. That's a stronghold in the mind. This steady process actually went through my college years. And uh, it isolated me from some people, but it also opened doors for me to, to testify to some. So while I was hiding from the perfect people, I was able to use a testimony with the non-perfect people because I didn't have anything to lose. didn't have anybody to compare myself to. <laughs> and then things got rough. See, I went to college for music. And the more you play the piano, the more you work muscles that you've never used before. And it was grace and mercy that I was even in college for music. Oh, that's a whole other story. But the more I would work, the more my arm would start to hurt. It was almost like God was letting this, this pain, this disability that was hidden, come to surface. And that hurts. See, when we have things hidden, we can ignore them. But when it comes to the surface, we're forced to deal with them. I didn't want to deal with them in college, but I had no choice. 
And the more I would play the piano or the more I would do things, the more my arm would kind of, it would kind of pull in and my fingers would draw up. And I thought I had one chance to do something for God, and that was in the music department. Now I can't even play the piano. And now if I get up and sing, I'm going to look like I'm completely deformed because my arm is all pulled up, and I'm going to draw all the attention, and God can't get the glory if people are looking at how weird I am. (laughs) Sounds shallow, but, but when you're in this place, I sought out anything and anyone who could fix me. During that summer, after my first semester of college, our first year of college, my mother actually made an appointment for me to see a neurologist in another town. I was so excited. I had never actually seen a neurologist because this was just part of my life. And so I was so excited. And I go to this appointment. I'm laid out on this table, and I've got my arm out. And I have a slide here. He did a EMG on me, which is where they put electrodes and they kind of like shock the nerves and they put a little speaker thing in your muscle and every time you move your arm it'll show up as a graph like on the screen okay and so that that's kind of the general idea of it so I'm laying there I'm like oh this is it I'm gonna be normal you know this hurts but that's okay I'm gonna be normal I'm so excited and I lay there and he's doctor sitting there he's clicking buttons hmm hmm anybody else have a doctor that just says hmm that was, that was his love language right there was, hmm. So he says, hmm. And I'm like, what? What? Ah, I'm dying. Ah. And he says, well, hmm. <laughs> so after a few minutes of the hmms and him having me move my arm, he said, well, sorry, I can't help you. <sighs> what do you mean you can't help me? If you can't help me, nobody can. You got to fix it. All of my faith is in you, the doctor. Did I mention I was raised in church and I've seen mighty miracles? But my faith was in someone I expected to be able to make it better. So he just looked at me, very matter of fact, and he goes, all right, look. So he turns the screen around really fast. He said, pull your arm up. So I did. He said, Let, put it back down. I said, okay. And I'm just laying there. I said, what? I don't see anything on the screen. <laughs> he said, exactly. He said, because what you're doing is impossible. There was no graph. Nothing. My arm was receiving no nerve signals at all. Even in my moment of mistaken identity, when I was questioning, I was struggling, oh, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why would you only halfway heal me? I could not deny, I could not deny his hand in my life. I sat there and wallowed in my self-pity while he told me he couldn't do anything about it. And when that doctor looked at me, he said, what you're doing is impossible. You shouldn't be able to move your arm. He said, there's no scientific reason whatsoever why you can move your arm. Tears welled up in my eyes, and I said, oh, do you believe in God? (laughs) He was like, well, I believe in something because I can't explain this. My first reaction was self-pity, and my second reaction was, this isn't really about me. I'm here in this perfect opportunity where I can tell this doctor, look, Look what God has done. Look what God is doing. And I wish I could tell you that I left that doctor's office a changed person. I do. I wish I could tell you that I walked out of there absolutely triumphant and ready to tackle the world and secure in who I was in Christ. But I could not do that. I remember thinking this was my last hope because this doctor could finish what God did not. I'm being very transparent with you. I felt like God had only half done the job and this doctor would do the rest of it. I see the error in that logic now, but at the time it made sense. 
when God only takes you part of the way. And I struggled with that. I wished I had have known then that when God took me part of the way, he didn't walk away at that point when I thought it was incomplete. Because he who has begun a great work. I asked God to heal me. He did not. I asked God to take the pain away, and he did not. Mm. Pastor, I hope this is okay. I, I, um, my God is a healer, and he is a restorer, and he is also all-knowing, and he is all-powerful, and his ways are much greater than mine, and his ways are much higher than mine. I would have mighty men of God filled with faith come and pray for me. I would feel the overwhelming power and presence of God in my life, and I would think, I'm going to throw my arm in the air, and it's going to be completely healed. And that's as far as it would go. I'm like, God, why can you heal other people and not me? Why am I only half healed? Have you? Be transparent with me for a second. Has anybody ever questioned, God, why are you touching everyone else and here I am? I think we have all struggled with that at some point in our life. And I was truly lost and I was concerned. I asked God to remove the pain. He did not, but he did send somebody who was anointed. And she introduced me to a spirit-filled chiropractor. And when I went to see that chiropractor, before I even talked to him, I sat there and cried. <laughs> I sat in the office. He said, well, what can we do for you today? I said, I <laughs> and then I bawled. And he was like, okay, well, we'll fix that. And, <laughs> and so, right? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> and that's how it happened. And then God touched me. I don't know. And so he prayed with me. This chiropractor prayed with me before he ever did a thing. I was like, well, Lord, you must have sent him into my life. And he did, and within one session with that chiropractor, I was able to touch my face for the first time in my life with my left hand. He saw things that other people had not seen. When a surgeon told me there was no hope, chiropractor prayed, and he was able to do things that the surgeon couldn't do. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why some of my emotion was limited in my, my body. It's not because of the tragedy. It was because of me. Because when I learned that something was wrong, I started treating my illness differently. And I started favoring that illness. And I gave it a place in my life that I had not given it before. And it created damage and problems that were not there to start with. So I had muscles that weren't supposed to be there that had to be worked out. Can I tell you that that was painful? Those things that I had allowed to build in my life and when they were taken care of, that hurt. That hurt. Over the course of my adulthood, I studied and I searched for answers on why I was partially healed. Partially healed. And then one day, when my spirit was right, God allowed me to answer my own question. I was speaking with a lady about my arm and how God had touched me. Notice I did not say how God healed me. I said how he touched me because I had allowed that to change in my mind. <laughs> and she asked me, she said, well, why would God not completely heal you? Without missing a beat, I responded because I was only three months old. And if he had a completely healed me, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now because you would have not noticed that there was something different about my arm. If God had healed me when I was three months old, I would have never remembered it. It wouldn't have opened a conversation of, hey, what's different about you? Well, let me tell you what's different about me. Let me tell you, the doctor said it's impossible for me to even move my arm, but look at this, look what I can do. That would have never happened if God had answered the prayer to completely heal me. And I realized my scar was my testimony. 
My scars are my open door. Yes. Anybody have a scar that God has used? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Let me read a verse to you really quick. Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. I realize that good preachers give you a text at the beginning of their sermon. I'm giving an encouraging word today, so I can pick any time during this to say it. Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. It says, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him, speaking of Jesus, and touched the hem of his garment. For he said within, or she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. That hour, God touched her from 12 years of infirmity. 12 years of isolation. Know that because she was different, and she was noticeably different, she had to separate herself from society. And God touched 12 years of struggle and health issues and problems. Now, let me ask you a question. What is her name? We know that lady by her issue. Twelve years of an infirmity wiped off, but she's only known by her issue. God has a greater identity for you and for me than our issue. Yes, he has called us to be more than conquerors. He has called you by name. He doesn't call you by the, the one that's broken, the one that's damaged. You are his and you are loved. Yes. That day I changed my mind and I transformed my identity through the power of God. That's not something you do on your own. You see, when the Holy Ghost comes in and it starts moving in your life, you have the power to transform the way you think about yourself. Your identity is not only who you are, it's who you think you are. Your license may say one thing, but if you think you are something different, <laughs> our mind is a powerful thing. Now, I realize some of you are probably thinking, what in the world does this have to do with Mother's Day? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you. Let me, let me check my, my stopwatch here. Very quickly, I, I want to tell you something. <laughs> Mothers, I know. Now, identity is something that everybody struggles with. It covers everything. But as a mother, we have a little bit of a different identity. It may not be a tragedy. You see, sometimes a loss of identity is not actually when it's stolen, but it's when it's sacrificed. We sacrifice our identity when we spend all of our time tending to children and we don't go to the maker who made us and we don't recharge and we don't rejuvenate and we don't have any kind of time to heal. We sacrifice who we are and we become invisible. We become in the background and we push the children to the, to the front and that's okay as long as there's a secret place where you can get away with God. Because when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter if your child makes the top softball team or if they are, you know, whatever in school. What matters is, did they see Mama pray? <laughs> Do they know who Mama's talking to in that prayer closet? Does Mama have somewhere to go for strength? Or has Mama done lost her mind? <laughs> well, hallelujah. So I was working on a project one day. And this is just very briefly. I was working on a project one day, and I came across this fascinating article about invisible mothers. During the 1800s, when photography was still kind of a new concept, people had to sit really still to take a picture. I can't imagine. I can't. I can't I'm too hyper. Couldn't imagine. In order to take a picture of a child, they had to have something to keep that child from moving. And what better thing to keep mom, or the child from moving than mom, right? So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from the 1800s. This beautiful little girl is not amused one bit about taking a picture. She is not happy to be there. She is tolerating the adults in her life. 
and we can see why she is remaining to stay there in our second slide. Um, there is her mother under that area rug. Isn't that classy? Yes, I love that. Um, our next one, <laughs> I can just hear the photographer in this one. Just put your hand there and steady the baby. Nobody will ever notice. They won't know that it's you, I promise. Go ahead to our next slide. Uh, he obviously had no idea what he's talking about. This may be the first time that that magical mother's hand was actually caught on a photograph. We see it whenever the, the brakes slam on and that hand comes out from nowhere to stop the kid. Yeah, it was actually caught right there on the photograph. And this last one, when you've got double the joy and double the challenge, let's just throw these curtains over mom's head and see what happens. Yep. <laughs> Nobody will ever know that's her. You've got to give it to them for creativity, right? Creativity. But let me tell you what happens when mom becomes invisible. Testimonies cease to happen in the house. When mom forgets how powerful and how called and how anointed she is, she sees her children as a task or something that she's responsible for, and she forgets that they are somebody that God has entrusted her with. Wisdom ceases to be passed on, and other voices replace the influence in the child's life. God called a mother with a special challenge. You are training his children. Think about that. God entrusted you to his children. That's a little bit different than just, oh, I love my children. I really do. I wish they'd sleep. But I love them. I do love them. And, you know, I haven't had a shower in six days, but that's okay because the kids look great when they're taking their pictures or whatever. It's different when you think about the fact that God's entrusted you with his children. The greatest ministry you may ever have may be the child you're raising. Think about who you're investing in. Equip them. Remember that you are a child of the king, and so are they. I'm going to I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to let you know that I'm closing here. Um, that's normally my cue to go to the keyboard, so I'm kind of out of I'm out of realms here. So um, you can give them hope here in a second, sis. Just a little over a year ago, my family was blessed with one of the greatest trials of our life. And I know that sounds odd. It would have sounded odd to me a year and a half ago. But I understand it now. Because God doesn't punish you with trials. He trusts you with them. I didn't understand that. I, I really didn't. I thought, oh my goodness, the devil's after me. Oh, he's going to be the destroyer. He's going to kill me. He's going to wipe me out. But sometimes he's developing. Sometimes God is allowing you to go through something that will be your testimony in your future. What you may see as damage, he may see as investments. My husband and I have been married for a lot of years. I don't know. 18 years maybe, is that right? 17, 18 years, something like that. We were married in 2001. Y'all do the math. That's not my strong point. There you go, 18 years. And I know that God is a healer. But I also learned when to trust that God has got the complete picture in his hand. A little over a year ago, my perfectly healthy husband, who likes to rub in the fact that he doesn't even need glasses, because he has perfect sight, you know, and, and that's, but that's okay, because I feel bifocals are coming. All of a sudden, mm -hmm, uh, all of a sudden, my perfectly hus my healthy husband was diagnosed with a brain tumor, having no symptoms. We thought he had a sinus infection. But that was it. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and it, required almost a month in the hospital and rehab and, and just complete craniotomy. It, it's an incredible testimony that I, I don't have time to, to completely share. If you want to read up on it, you can go to my post on Facebook and go back to April of last year. And it's just, it's an incredible testimony of how God moves in the lives of people who will let him do it and how many lives were touched. It's amazing. 
And a lot of those stories from that time are actually on Facebook, but there's some that you won't find. The long night when I slept in a waiting room of an ICU, waiting and questioning because my husband was in a medically induced coma. You see, I didn't question God. I've already been through that. And I know that scars aren't always a bad thing. I know that sometimes hard stuff happens. And when God doesn't completely heal, he still restores. You know, you can go to heaven with an, uh, some kind of illness or whatever. You can die with an illness and still go to heaven, and that's okay. We don't all have to be perfectly healthy when we go to see Jesus. I didn't understand that until God touched me and my mind, and I realized the scar was my testimony. So while my husband was in a coma, I was in a waiting room by myself, and I didn't question God. I questioned me. I was okay with whatever God wanted to do. I was not as confident in what I could let God do through me. Have you ever questioned, can God really do that through me? Can he really use me to do something? Who am I? You are who he designed. You are who he's called. You are who has a purpose. Yes. I have a picture after my husband came out of surgery, having never spent a day in the hospital in his life. I did something that I never thought I would have to do. I have a picture of me holding his hand back there. I had to surrender not my health but my husband's heart see I held his heart he belongs to me God gave him to me but I had to give him back because I couldn't fix it see as a mom we have this nature that we want to help and fix and make it better and most of the time we can but when it's out of our hands I had to give my husband back to God, which I should have done in the first place. And then I had to trust that God was going to use not just my husband, but me through this entire situation. I had no idea what the future was going to hold. I had no idea if my husband was even going to make it. I had no idea what was going to happen for our young girls or for our church. I had no idea. One of those nights when I was sitting in the waiting room that I I have a picture of, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and my heart was completely and totally overwhelmed. I hurt for the possibility of the future. The ICU nurse had told me, she said, now you need to prepare yourself, because when he wakes up, he's going to be a different person. I hadn't thought of that. I had faith all the way up till that point when she said he may not even know who you are when he wakes up. And I thought, I barely know who I am. I've spent 30-something years trying to figure out who I am. I can't be thrown this curveball in the later part of my life. Oh, my goodness, what am I going to do if my husband doesn't know who I am and I'm trying to convince him and me? Goodness, what do you do with that, right? So while I, I... questioned what are you using me for what in the world am I going to do to survive through this God did something incredible it was almost like he spoke to me and he told me just go ahead and grab your husband's Bible which I had with me the whole time and it's a beast, okay? It's a big old Bible. And I grab it, you know, and I, I open it up. I'm like, Lord, I just, you're going to have to direct me. I'm not feeling real studious at the moment. I can't go looking through chain reference stuff. 
And I opened his Bible, and on the very first page, before you even got to the actual words, there was a post-it note written there in his handwriting, my husband's handwriting. It said, if Satan tempted Jesus to question his own identity, why would he do any less when it comes to us? I thought, my husband's in a coma, but God used him to speak to my heart. And I was reminded of who I am. I am a child of the king. I am called. I'm not in this alone. He is there. He has called me. We're not in this place for happenstance. God has a purpose. God has a purpose. In your life, God has a purpose. Don't let the devil question your identity. Don't let him let you question your identity. You are called for a reason. Jesus swept into that room that day, middle of the night. My tears are flowing. I'm crying. I'm praying. I'm speaking in tongues here in the waiting room all by myself. And it was such a beautiful moment because God wrapped his arms around me and he reminded me that I belong to him. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, You are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood and a holy nation. You are peculiar. Now, I know that sounds like you're just kind of different. You're weird. Another translation says it this way. You're a special people. You're a special people. When you see children running around, okay, yeah, that's cute. But when you see your child, your heart just kind of smiles a little bit, right? When Jesus sees you, he smiles. Because you are his and you are special. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 2 says, But now saith the Lord that createth thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee. That means that everything that you are, God made it on purpose. He designed you. He designed you. He said, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Do you know what redeemed means? It means he bought you again. That means not only did he pay the price for you, but when you went away from him or when you were acting a fool somewhere, he still died on the cross for you. He loved you enough to go to wherever you were and just remind you, hey, you're mine and I love you. It doesn't matter what you've gotten yourself into. You, I love you still. Because you are just that special, just that special. He said, I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by name. When you don't even know who you are, he knows your name. When you question what you are and what you have to offer, he knows your name. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And when thou, through the rivers, thou shalt not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You're not alone. He's got you. He's got you. If you will stand with me, sis, if you'll give them some hope. <laughs> Today, I know it's, it's Mother's Day, and I give honor to moms, because if ever there is a lady out there who is forced to question your identity at some point, it's a mom. I know. I've been there. I am there. And I want you to know that God loves you and he sees you where you are. I realize that there are moms that struggle on Mother's Day because your mom is not here. And I realize there are ladies who have always wanted to be a mom and God has other plans for you. And I know that there are people who struggle in so many different ways. There are dads here that are struggling and there are teens here who are trying to figure out where they're at in life and what God's doing in their life. But God has called you by name. It doesn't matter where you've been and it doesn't matter what you've brought into this place. If you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, today's your day. God designed this day for you. He designed this service for you. If you're struggling and you feel you've got a smile and you're beautiful but you're thinking, I don't even know who I am anymore. I don't know. The best of my life is over. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Your best days are yet to come. God has an anointing for your future. 
God has something powerful for you if you will allow yourself to be identified the way that he sees you. If you'll bow your heads with me, I'd like to lead us in prayer. The altars are open. You are welcome to come. God has something powerful for you today in this service. God, I love you and I praise you, Jesus. God, I thank you because you have called us by name. We are yours. God, I love you and I praise you and I trust you, Jesus. Lord, when I don't understand, God, I know you are in control. Lord, I trust you with my past and with my present and with my future. Lord, I ask that you would sweep through this place today, God, and restore and renew, Lord. God, I ask that you would comfort those that have been wounded or that are weary, dear God, and remind them of who they are. Lord, let there be a sweet presence that sweeps through this place, dear God, right now. We love you and we praise you, Jesus, for what you're doing. Lord, you are powerful and you are mighty, God. Lord, I worship you, Jesus. Will you worship him with me? God, I praise you and I magnify you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. God, you are holy and you are mighty, Jesus. God, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for where you brought us from, God, and I thank you for the future that you have for us. Lord, I praise you and I magnify you, Jesus.